All right, uh, this morning uh, we're, we're back in Luke's gospel. We are um, going to be looking at verses 27 through 38, and this is Jesus' encounter with the Sadducees. And we'll look a little bit more at who the Sadducees are because they do seem to be a bit more of the unfamiliar group that we keep running into, or at least, well, not all the time. We only see them a few times in Scripture, but they are a distinct group. And their belief system is, is important for us to see up front, especially as we consider their question, because, again, this question is meant only to try to trap Jesus. Okay. So let's first of all read the text, and then we'll, we'll get into it. So beginning in verse 27 in Luke chapter 20. Now there came to him some of the Sadducees who say that there is no resurrection. And they questioned him saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies having a wife and he is childless, his brother should marry the wife and raise up children to his brother. Now there were seven brothers and the first took a wife and died childless. And the second and the third married her, and in the same way all seven died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died also. In the resurrection, therefore, which one's wife will she be? For all seven had married her. Jesus said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot even die anymore because they are like angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the burning bush where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Some of the scribes answered and said, Teacher, you have spoken well, for they did not have courage to question him any longer about anything. I read those last two verses. It's sort of a transition between uh, what he just said and what he's going to say in our next passage. But again, may the Lord bless uh, this part of his word to our understanding this morning. I think... Uh, uh, one thing that will be particularly interesting is this law that uh, they quote. We want to take a little closer look at that and what that was all about and certainly want to consider whether that has any application uh, for today. Now, last week, again, let me just remind you, we saw the Pharisees and the Herodians come to Jesus with a question about taxes, whether it was God's will for the Jews to pay them to the Roman government. Now, we understand that was not an honest question. It was a question designed to trap Jesus. If he answered yes, the Pharisees, who hated Rome and their demands upon the Jewish people, would accuse him to the people uh, because, as we know, the Jews expected that the one who had come to free them from the tyranny of Rome would also free them from a paying tribute. If he answered yes, the Pharisees would have him, but if he answered no, then the Herodians who supported the Roman government would accuse him to the authority, authorities and either way, of course, they would have him. But Jesus saw through their deception and he escaped their snare. We saw that he made it perfectly clear that they should pay these taxes and that certainly made the Herodians happy. But he said it in such a way that I think the Jewish people could see that it was God's will that they do this and it was right and it was good. Because even though it was you know, a government they didn't want to be under the authority of, it still uh, provided many benefits for them, benefits that God said that they should pay them for because they are serving Him. Now, Jesus also used this as an opportunity to remind them that they were indebted not only to Caesar but also to God and that they should therefore give Him what they owed, not the least of which would be that they would receive and submit to his Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would listen to his word and that they would obey him. Now, Jesus tells us that we're to do the same. This wasn't something that was only for them. 
We are to give to Caesar. We are to give to the government what belongs to the government because God ordained them for our good. And again, I would just remind you, we are experiencing a great deal of good from our government right now, and I think it's a good thing that we have them. Otherwise, there wouldn't be much of um, really an economy left and a lot more people would die. So we are to support them with taxes and we are to submit to their laws, at least as long as they don't contradict God's law. And of course, we are to give to God what belongs to Him. Remember last week we were reminded that uh, even as the coin that Jesus asked for had the image of Caesar stamped on it, and He says, give to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar, we have God's image stamped upon us. We belong to Him, and so we need to give to Him what we owe Him, and that is certainly everything. We owe Him our hearts, we owe Him our worship, we owe Him our lives. And that is, a matter of fact, what our Lord tells us, that we need to be willing to give to Him if we are to follow Him. Now, their plot having failed, this morning we see another group approach Him with another question, and this time it is the Sadducees. And so here's where we need to just pause for a moment and consider who these people are. Josephus tells us that the Sadducees were actually among the more wealthy and affluent in the Jewish culture. So they were the upper echelon of society. They had resources. And that explains why they were connected to the temple, because they were basically the patrons of the temple. They were the ones who supported the temple. They were the ones who maintained it. Not necessarily the... Um, you know, the giving of the sacrifices because those were brought by the people themselves, but rather who maintained the repair of the temple. They were very much connected to it. And it also explains why this particular sect of Judaism disappeared when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. No temple, no group of people to maintain it. Now, I think more importantly, though, for our subject this morning, we need to understand the Sadducees were what we would call the theological liberals of the day. And what we mean by liberalism in this case is not political liberalism, although there is a similarity in the way that the words are used, but it, what it means is those who have compromised the truth of Scripture, who might accept parts of it, but they don't accept other parts of it. And the reason why they were in that particular camp, why they had this particular persuasion, was because they um, were influenced by the philosophers of their time. As you know, philosophy started quite a long time ago among the Greeks, uh, several hundred years B.C. Uh, and uh, we know that as philosophy has always been influencing uh, not just the culture but also the church through the ages, and we have what we would call liberal Christianity today, which sort of has a, a form of Christianity but really denies the truths of Christianity, so they had liberal Jews in those days who were basically in the same boat. Philosophy had caused them to compromise. They no longer embraced everything the Bible teaches. Let me just pause for a moment here and say this, that we need to understand that philosophy is dangerous. It can be very dangerous. Now, we know there are exceptions, but more often than not, philosophy amounts really to nothing more than man's attempt to try to explain how everything came to be, uh, essentially how, well, of course, how we understand or learn things that we do, but that's really not so important as also how we should live. How do we come to be here? And how should we live? But they try to do this apart from God's words which we know is the truth and is the standard, it is the revelation of God. Now, we know that anything that depreciates or attempts to set God's Word aside is very dangerous. And that's the temptation when one comes to study philosophy, is you might be tempted to see that as the means to learn the truth rather than to trust in God's Word. The only reason we should ever study philosophy is really just to understand why unbelievers or even liberal Christians believe what they believe, try to understand how they arrived at that conclusion so that we can refute it and lead them to the truth. It's not so that we can find the key to knowledge. God has already given that to us in His Word. Well, you know, the interesting thing is, again, the Sadducees... Uh, 
they had embraced, again, Greek philosophy and it had caused them to reject certain portions of God's Word. There were certain things that they did believe. They believed that God exists. Well, again, congratulations, uh, the whole world believes that that's true. God has given to us a revelation that can't be denied. But it is interesting that they also accepted parts of the Bible. Well, liberal Christians do as well, don't they? Liberal denominations at least to keep up the appearance that they are Christians. These were keeping up appearances that they were Jews. And what they accepted was the Torah, the law, the Old Testament, but they denied certain portions of it. What they accepted was the morality. So they believed in God and they were moral, but yet they were still in the dark and unconverted because they denied certain things that were essential. And listen to the list of denials. They denied the existence of angels. They denied the continuance of the soul after death. They denied the resurrection. And so, of course, in denying that, they denied also ultimate rewards for the righteous and ultimate punishments for the wicked. When you die, you just simply go out of existence. Now, I think we need to understand that. And understanding this, of course, will help us see what their real motive was when they were approaching Jesus. This also was not an honest question, but was one that was meant to try to trap him. So let's consider, first of all, their question, which was a question about the resurrection, something that they did not believe in. And again, this um, was an attempt that they were making to prove to Jesus from the standard that Jesus also held to, the law of God. Sometimes the law of God, I should mention, is referring just to the first five books of Moses. But other times it is referring to what the Jews would call the Tanakh, which would be the the Torah, uh, the the writings, and uh, the the prophets, okay? So I could explain why they call it Tanakh. It's not really important at this particular juncture. So they were trying to prove to Jesus and also perhaps to the Pharisees who were their theological opponents on this particular issue because the Pharisees also believed in the resurrection. They were trying to prove from the law the resurrection could not be true. Now, if they were successful, they would at the very least expose Jesus as a flawed teacher because he was teaching something that wasn't true. But at the very most, they might expose him as a false teacher, something which the Pharisees would not have objected to. Remember how we talked about last week, when you have a common opponent, it can cause people that would... You know, otherwise, never even uh, agree on anything to close ranks. Well, here we see the Sadducees and the Pharisees, again, closing ranks to come at Jesus. Now, their question was based upon an Old Testament law, a law which we may be familiar with and perhaps we're not familiar with, and perhaps we don't even understand why the law existed in the first place. But it's called the law of the leverate. Now, that's what they're actually quoting in verse 28 where they say, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife, that is married, and he is childless, his brother should marry the wife and raise up children to his brother. So basically what this law is saying is this, that if an Israelite man was a married man and he dies before he and his wife have any children, his brother was to marry his brother's widow. Okay, and that is presuming that the brother had not already married. And then the firstborn that they would have, and I believe that that firstborn had to be a firstborn son, would be reckoned as belonging to the deceased brother. In other words, it wouldn't be the brother who marries her, wouldn't be his child, but it would be reckoned as the deceased brother's child. Now, if the man had no brothers, or if the brothers were already married, then the duty would fall to the next closest relation. Now, by the way, this is very practical to understand this because we see its application in the Bible. We remember Ruth and her situation, okay, the daughter-in-law of of Naomi who had gone to the land of uh, Moab, I believe, uh, or was Edom to to survive because of the famine. That was Moab. In in order to survive the famine, and there uh, the two sons of... um, Elimelech and Naomi marry um, uh, two daughters, uh, Orpah and Ruth. But then both of, the, both of the brothers die, remember? Her husband, Ruth's husband, um, 
Mahlon uh, died, and his brother Killian also died. So, in other words, there were no more brothers to do this duty of marrying her and raising up seed. So the duty fell to the next of kin when they were back in the land. We're talking about redemption in order to survive. Now, since the next of kin did not want to jeopardize his own inheritance by marrying Ruth, he passed the responsibility over to Boaz, who was the next one in line. And after he had, Boaz said to the elders of the city, now listen to what he says here in Ruth 4, verses 9 and 10, because it really encapsulates the idea of what, what was behind all of this. He says to the elders, you are witnesses today that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilian and Mahlon. Moreover, I have acquired Ruth, the Moabitess, the widow of Mahlon, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance so that the name of the deceased will not be cut off from his brothers or from the court of his birthplace. You are witnesses today. Now, we know that Boaz had other motives uh, behind his marriage to, to Ruth. He saw her as a virtuous woman, and he wanted to marry her because he had affections for her. But it was, it was in order to, uh, to do this duty, and he was willing to do this to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. Now, again, this law seems strange to us today, but it actually had several good purposes. And the first one we've just read, it was to keep the name of the deceased from being blotted out from Israel. It ensured that the man who died would have an heir who would inherit his portion of the land. In those days in Israel, it was important that the land stay within the members of those tribes. Now, secondly, it was also meant to provide for the man's widow. I mean, how was she going to be provided for? Well, it was going to be, she was going to be provided for in this way. We do need to understand that marriage in those days was not looked at exactly as it is in our day. It wasn't because of just romantic love that people married, okay? But they married for more practical uh, reasons, okay? But we need to see this most importantly uh, as a means or actually a picture that God provided, a type of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Whenever we go through the book of Ruth and we see this, this work of the, the kinsman redeemer, we think about our Lord Jesus. Now think about it in these terms. When Adam, who is our federal head, our covenant head, uh, sinned, okay, the father of the human race, uh, you know, I want us to look at this in just a slightly different analogy. Think of him rather in the analogy of, of a, a marriage, because uh, Jesus comes into the world as the second Adam, and Adam is the first Adam, and as the second Adam, Jesus redeems us, but in doing so, he becomes our husband. Let's think about Adam as our covenant head, in, in this analogy, as our husband. Okay, well, in his sinning against God, he dies, okay? So now we need to be redeemed, at least according to this analogy, uh, to be provided for. So Jesus comes into the world as one of us, he becomes our close relative in order that he might redeem us, in order that he might marry us so that we might receive the inheritance, okay? So think about it in these terms. This is really a picture the Lord has given to us of the Lord Jesus and his work. He is our relative. He is the one who redeems us. So he gave it to us, <clears throat> gave it to Israel as a means to preserve the inheritance of the brother. He gave it to it as a means to take care of, of the widow, but he also gave it as a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. That was the reason why this law existed. Now, the question we need to consider now is whether or not this law is still in, in effect. Now, that's really a question we should always be asking whenever we read the Old Testament and we read of some duty that the Lord required of His people in those days. Does it continue or has it been abrogated? Let me just remind you, whatever God puts in force, whatever He requires, remains basically in force until He clearly sets it aside. So we need to ask that question about this duty. And by the way, we need to ask about all the others as well. Uh, whenever we come across them 
Well, let me just say, and I think a sigh of relief will probably be given, that this has been fulfilled and so abrogated through the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, for one thing, the land inheritance is no longer relevant. It was really a picture of the new heavens and the new earth, which is far more expansive. But our Lord Jesus Christ has come into the world. He has fulfilled this type. He is our kinsman redeemer, which is why Paul tells us very clearly in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39, with regard to the situation today, if a wife is married and her husband dies, he says, a wife is bound as long as her husband lives. And that's one reason why we should be very careful about whom we enter into this covenant with, because it is binding as long as the husband lives. We know there are exceptions. But he goes on to say, but if her husband is dead, her husband's brother must marry her? No, that's not what he says. He says she is free to be married to whom she wishes. In other words, it's her choice now. She doesn't have to marry her, her brother's or her husband's brother. But notice also, only in the Lord, okay? She must marry someone who is a genuine believer. Okay, so that's the law they're quoting. It was in force in those days, but it's no longer in force today. So having quoted this law, the Sadducees next propose a hypothetical situation. One that they believed would reduce the resurrection to an absurdity. There's, again, this is a... Um, a logical, in this case, a logical fallacy, okay? Now, their question is this. There were seven brothers. First one took a wife. He died, died childless. The second one married her. The third, all the way down to the seventh. All died without having children. Finally, the woman died. So the question was, in the resurrection, therefore, which one's wife will she be? For all seven married her. Okay, the question, that's the question. Now, secondly, let's consider how Jesus refutes this. Now, notice, first of all, how the whole argument, their whole argument is based on the fact that marriage continues after the resurrection. Well, that's the thing that Jesus addressed first, because if he, if he can cause that to fall or if he can, he can refute that, the question is really irrelevant. We read in verses 34 through 36, he said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot even die anymore because they are like angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. You know, as I read this passage, I can't help but remember the head of the Bible department at the college that Donna and I attended used to talk about his father. The number of marriages that his father had gone through before becoming a believer, okay, and the difficulty God was going to have in sorting out which wife would be his in heaven, okay, this is the, the head of the Bible department at the college we attended. Basically, he, had, he was asking the same question the Sadducees uh, were asking Jesus on this occasion. Now, if he had read this passage, we have the light of the New Testament, we have the answer here. If he had read, I, I can't imagine he read this, if he had understood what it meant, his answer would have been question. Uh, it was, excuse me, his, his, his question would have been answered, wouldn't it, right? Which is, none of them will be his father's wife because in heaven there is no marrying or given in marriage. Marriage is only for this life. Now, we know from the Scriptures that marriage is a covenant of companionship. It was created by the Lord for us at the beginning of the world so that we would not be on our own, so that we would have somebody like us to help us in life, to work with us, to bear our burdens with us, to be able to weather the storms that we have to face in life with us, with whom we might be able to raise children, uh, to have children and to raise them in His ways but I think more importantly, so that we would have somebody to help us in all the struggles we would have to face on our way to heaven. Remember how the Lord tells us that if a person stands alone, he might easily fall. Uh, woe to the one who doesn't have somebody else to help, help him stand or to bear up, and a threefold, coal, uh, excuse me, a threefold cord cannot easily be broken. 
And we understand that today is not being just the husband and the wife, but also the Lord Jesus Christ being involved in that relationship. That relationship will stand. Well, we understand that relationship is really only for our time here on earth. Once we're in heaven or once we're in, on the new earth, we're no longer going to need this companionship in the same way that the angels do not need it right now. And the reason is because the Lord provides for them. The reason is because they have that companionship among themselves. They, they do not need the, the kind of companionship we have here, plus there's no procreation in heaven. So there isn't that special relationship between the man and the woman that we would have on earth. Now, the Lord has promised uh, that He's going to provide for us once we're in heaven. And He's also given to us the perfect saints, and He's given to us the angels to be our companions so that we will no longer need them. Now again, this is something the head of the Bible department should understand, and Jesus is going to tell the Sadducees something they should have understood if they would just simply read the Bible. Now that's why we need to read the Bible as well, isn't it? Because it is the only revelation God has given to us in words to explain the things that we need to know, to explain the truth, what we are to believe regarding Him, what we are to believe regarding the future, how it is we are to live. And that's the reason also why our enemy, as he did in the case of the Sadducees through philosophy, is going to do everything that he can to keep us out of the Word or to try to discredit the Word in some way. Again, just as he does in liberal Christianity today, just as he does in the minds of the unbelievers, just as he did in the case of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, all of whom, for the most part, were unbelievers. Now, there were some exceptions among the Pharisees, but you can't believe what the Sadducees believe and be saved. If you reject the Word of God, you cannot be a Christian. So we need to pay attention to God's Word. Now, there's another thing here that we shouldn't miss, and maybe you didn't miss it as I was reading through these verses, where Jesus tells us, He was telling the Sadducees that not everyone is going to go to heaven, right? Listen again to what He says in verse 35. He says, only those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and the resurrection from the dead. He was trying to point out to the Sadducees, as He's also pointing out, out to us this morning, that not everyone is going to fall in that category. Now, everyone is going to be raised from the dead on the day of God's judgment. Jesus is going to come. If we had read in 1 Corinthians 15 a little bit further, we'd see Paul say that. Jesus is going to come, and He's going to empty out the tombs. Everyone is going to have to stand before Him, and all the living are also going to be gathered. But not everyone, obviously, is going to enter into heaven, only those who are worthy. So then the question rises, uh, well, who is worthy? Well, certainly, we can't, we are not worthy in and of ourselves. No one is worthy in and of ourselves, and that's why we need Jesus, because only He is. And that's why Jesus calls us to Himself. He says in Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30, "'Come to Me, all who are weary and heavy laden,' and I think what He's saying here is those of you who are weary of your sins and are, are tired of failing to live up to what you know you should live because you do not have the power. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Now, I think we all understand that that is how we are found to be worthy in the Lord Jesus Christ, but I think there's something we don't often think about as often as we should, and that is how do we know that we are worthy in the Lord Jesus Christ? Because the Sadducees certainly believed that they would be accepted by God. The Pharisees certainly believed that they would be accepted by God. We need to understand that there are many people today who believe that God is going to accept them, but He's not going to accept them because they're not really the Lord's. They're not really trusting in Jesus. If we had more time to explore this, we would find out from the Scriptures that we do need to have more than just a belief that what the Bible says is true. 
We need to have more than just good morals. You know, we need to be more than just those who are good rule keepers. The Lord tells us that if we really belong to Jesus, we will love Him. We will find the, the greatest commandment being fulfilled within us, which is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and mind and soul and strength, that we will be following Jesus. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and you will do that no matter how difficult it might be. And you'll be grieved over the fact when you don't keep the commandments of God. Now, the Bible says if that's what your desire is, if that's what you're striving toward, then you really are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. You really have believed. What am I saying? I'm saying what the Reformer said, that we are justified by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. It is based upon His works alone, but there is no justification without sanctification. There's no true faith without works. And those works, that sanctification is generated, created by love. We will desire the Lord. We will desire His ways. We will follow Him. So, in other words, we won't need somebody writing us all the time to get us to do what's right. We will do what's right because that's what we want to do. That is the blessing, again, of the new covenant. The law of God being written upon our hearts, that work of the Holy Spirit, which is essentially the new birth. So, that's how we know that we are actually worthy to... Uh, achieve the resurrection from the dead is that we love the Lord. We truly love Him and we are doing what He calls us to do from the heart, not because outside forces and pressures are making us conform and do these things really against our will. Now, finally, Jesus has refuted their argumentation, you know, by again uh, pointing out from... Um, uh, well, first of all, that um, they misunderstood the Scriptures. There is a resurrection. Um, he, um, uh, well, again, let's see. Oh. It has, well, anyway, he's, he's pointed out this, this particular um, point. He moves on now to uh, refute the argument. Again, um, their argument was there could be no resurrection because um, there would be this confusion in the end of um, whose wife he's going to be. But Jesus, rather than giving them just a, um, a, a negative argument here, decides to go also on the offense to give them uh, a positive argument for the resurrection from the Torah that they claim to believe. So we read now in verses 37 and 38. But that the dead are raised... Even Moses showed in the passage about the burning bush where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. So, he basically here is, is quoting Exodus 3.16. And if we were to see the whole thing, we would see even another part that, that says perhaps even more clearly, although what he, he quotes here is sufficient. I am the God of your father. Now, God says that to Moses. He doesn't say, I was the God of your father. I was the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. No, I am. He is not the God of the dead. He is not the God of those who are buried. He is not the God of those who no longer exists, which is what the, the Sadducees essentially believed. They didn't believe in the continuance of the soul after death. No, He is the God of the living. And if that wasn't clear enough, Jesus makes it even clearer in, chat, well, in, in verse 38, the very end. For all live to Him. Now, that, the way that's translated can be a little bit confusing. It almost sounds like it's saying everyone is living to him or everyone is living for his glory. And obviously he doesn't mean that, right? Because the majority, the vast majority of people in the world do not live for God's glory. Even the vast majority of those who claim to be Christians don't live for God's glory. He's saying something different. What he's saying is that though those who have died may seem dead to men, God sees that they are still alive. And I think the best way to translate this would be this. All 
are alive to Him. We need to remember that when God creates a soul, that soul continues even after the body dies. So all are alive to Him because they are actually alive. Now, there's a sense in which those who are in hell are alive because their souls are immortal. Uh, they're aware that they exist. They're experiencing pain and suffering. And they will continue to be aware of this pain and this suffering forever, for time without end. And we would certainly have to say those who have died in the Lord are also alive because they have passed from death into that which is truly life. Now, this should be a comfort, obviously, to us who have lost loved ones in the Lord. They're not dead. They're actually living for the first time in their lives. What, what, they would, what they had on earth, they would consider by comparison to be death, okay? Remember what Jesus said to Martha in John 11, verses 25 through 26, what we read uh, in, the, um, in the meditation. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Uh, those who die in the Lord continue to live. And Paul tells us that when Jesus finally returns, in order to vanquish the last enemy, which is death, in this case physical death, in the resurrection, he will bring with him those who have died. We read in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 14. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Paul was saying that to the Thessalonians, to the believers there, so that they would not be grieved about those who had passed away. They have not missed out on heaven. Jesus is, is actually uh, going to raise them. The dead in Christ shall rise first, but he says he will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus, which means that their souls were carefully preserved and kept by the Lord in heaven in that state of blessedness, uh, in the interim. Now, that should comfort us about, you know, those whom we know and love, who have trusted the Lord, who have gone on before us, they are with the Lord. But it should also comfort us personally, especially during the time of this epidemic, right? Knowing that if our bodies should die, our souls will be with the Lord. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1, for we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. The Lord says that if you have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have a secure future. All you have to do is rely upon Him, trust in Him. Make sure you're not trusting in yourself. But again, let me just remind you that you do need to make sure that you have trusted Him. You need to make sure that your faith is more than just a belief in the facts. Remember, the demons believe and they tremble. That's more than a lot of Christians do, or at least who profess in the, in the Lord Jesus Christ. They believe, but they don't tremble. Your life needs to be more than just keeping rules. You really have to love the Lord and be serving Him with your whole heart according to the words. And if that's not what you're doing, then don't just simply assume that you are going to be, you know, that you are worthy in the Lord Jesus Christ and that you're going to enter into heaven. It isn't an automatic thing. So many people are going to come to Jesus in the last day and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, did we not do these mighty things in your name? And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. What does Jesus tell us there about the one who is truly saved? It's the one who practices the law from the heart. They're not saved because they did that, 
But their doing that shows that they actually are saved when they do it from the heart, and they are not doing it just simply for some other reason, to keep up appearances or even to maintain the illusion to themselves that they belong to Jesus. Make sure you have that genuine love for the Lord in your heart that moves you to do His will as you are trusting in Jesus alone for your salvation. If you have that, then you know that you will attain to the resurrection of life from the dead and that you will be with Him in that day forever and ever. Well, may the Lord grant that that would be the case for each one of us. Let's bow, shall we, in a moment of prayer and ask the Lord to search our hearts and to show us where we stand and then to respond accordingly.